Our keynote of the day um, comes from uh, Academian of Science, Professor Rita Hari from Aalto University. Uh, the topic will be fostering convergence across disciplines. Uh, please, uh, Rita, the floor is yours. Yeah, good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends. Uh, thank you for this invitation to talk about uh, conversions across disciplines. It's a topic that um, it has been my everyday life since decades, but uh, this seems to be the first first ever time that I'm speaking about it <laughs> somehow publicly, uh, not without colleagues. So, of course, the idea is that uh, most interesting problems, they know, don't need to come in packages that fit just one discipline, and that's why we have to try to converge across disciplines. This is a uh, session of uh, uh, interdisciplinary research, but my message today is that interdisciplinarity is not enough. And that's why I'm uh, trying to advocate that let's strive for convergence. And this convergence is a word that has been around, uh, according to my knowledge, about um, um, 11 or 10 years since uh, 2011 in MIT in one meeting. And thereafter, there have been quite much uh, discussion about convergence across disciplines, um, like in health or life sciences, physical sciences. And now today I'm uh, trying to provoke you a little bit telling what this um, convergence is, why we would need it, and how to foster it. And I start with this uh, picture that I'm going to show some parts of that later on in my talk. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, how we go from intra to multi to inter to trans to convergence research, all these strange words uh, that even scientists and uh, and the, or the organizations behind sometimes mix. So thinking first, on the left side, we have these three different uh, disciplines, people in different colors in the clothing. Sorry. Um, and they all have their own ideas. They can tolerate each other if they are in the same department, the same university, but they play their own games. So in multi, uh, multidisciplinary environments, people start talking to each other, by, but often they talk at, so that they talk, uh, address others in a self-important way without too much listening what others are saying. But they can get inspired uh, from the uh, work of others. Then we go to the interdisciplinary phase, where people really start already talking with each other, they can change methods, they can change ideas. But I would say that both the multi and interdisciplinary uh, uh, research, as I define them here, they are still quite egoistic in that sense that people are just driving to the, uh, towards their own goals. And then comes this uh, transdisciplinary or convergence research, and. Uh, I, I very much uh, prefer this word convergence because it uh, emphasizes the uh, scientific problems, whereas transdisciplinarity, uh, it uh, speaks about different disciplines. But here in this convergence research level, people are really trying to integrate knowledge and then also uh, they have common problems. So if we start here from uh, this uh, intradisciplinarity or unidisciplinarity, so there certainly are several disciplines um, where we don't need other disciplines, like in mathematics or astronomy, uh, other disciplines may not be needed. But this kind of unidisciplinarity does not exclude uh, teamwork. Often this kind of research is uh, very much focused on theory, formation, and not so much on applications. Then comes this multidisciplinarity, where people get inspired from others' work. They find analogies, but for their own benefit, just for their own work. 
So they, you see they still are playing with their own, own games there. Typically, these are some uh, projects of limited duration. Uh, time span is limited. It's often group rather than teamwork. And this really makes a difference because the, in, the information that has been um, got does not accumulate so well as it would be in real teams that would continue. Often it can be due to administrative pressure, which then means that it's also friction prone, because people then start to see different type of power uh, structures in the collaboration. And uh, most importantly, in this case, these, the results are additive. So one plus one equals two. <laughs> it's not yet integrative. People are somehow promoting their own research. Then this interdisciplinarity, as I see it, is then something where people are already transferring knowledge, exchanging methods, but still, as I mentioned earlier, for their own benefit. They can invite others to do some jobs that they can't do themselves. And importantly, this works only if all parties are highly motivated to join. This is the, really the key point here. And it's a very, very long learning process to really cultivate that kind of research teams. Um, we have a study that typically already for students, and then we have been doing weekly seminars, going through some books together, and then it has little by little that a research team has progressed. Uh, and uh, then somehow there's much, much more understanding. I did not mention earlier, but that somehow my background is in neurosciences, and I have had quite much collaboration with um, people from starting from physics, engineering, mathematics, uh, clinical uh, neuroscience, and then most recently in arts as well and humanities. So it seems that in all these teams, you have to really train each other. This is also friction prone if it's due to administrative pressure. And now it comes very clear that um, uh, communication skills are crucial because the other people, they have to understand what are the key observations, how they have been obtained, what are they somehow the uh, most difficult problems and how uh, reliably can we interpret the, the results. But here now the good thing is that one plus one can be more than two already. So there is some uh, additional value coming. Here uh, in this interdisciplinary research, we have to remember that these interdisciplinary experts need overlap to reach high. So here, oh, sorry, oh, there's some, some strange hap things happen here in the so have to <clears throat> reach high. And here I have a hill and there's a two persons on the, there's now some automatic <laughs> slide changes happen. So there's a hill behind and then the people with two different disciplines. So on the upper case, they have enough overlap so that they understand each other and then they can go high. But in the lower case, the cognitive distance or the somehow difference in the world views is so uh, big that they really can't reach any higher than they could do themselves. And this is really, uh, I, this is an issue in many, many interdisciplinary research attempts that has been started because of some administrative pressure. And here we also have to remember in the lower case here, the guru effect which is a <clears throat> nice term by Sperber. It's a, uh, he wrote that all too often what readers do is judge profound what they have failed to grasp. The same thing is that if you hear some people from the other field speaking about, for example, about the brain, so then it seems somehow relevant to your work and then it maybe it, it will be applied too much. So this, then there will be some kind of hijacking 
of other fields to the benefit of one field. So here's then the uh, convergence research with that really aims at unifying knowledge. And here, importantly, the problems are the key. So problems will define what kind of teams are then attacking them. And you see from the colors of these guys on the left that the clothing has already changed color a little bit because they have been interacting so much together. And the ideas now are uh, or the problems above the um, above are shown to be common to all of them. This is an expanded, uh, expanded form of interdisciplinarity, and it aims at integration of diverse perspectives, intellectual insights, knowledge and understanding. And it's the only way how we could tackle, tackle the victim, these very evil problems that I will discuss a little bit later. It may also include non-academic partners, especially for the implementation of the results. And it requires changes in attitudes and ways of thinking of researchers, research teams, organizations and funders. But the case can be high if, the, is, if we are successful, so that one plus one is now can be much larger than, than two. And here, of course, again, the communication is, is um, communication skills are, and demands are very high so that you can really speak across to other disciplines. And these are uh, this needs like a deep integration across dis disciplines and they, they can be the problems. What are they? They can be either challenges or opportunities either in society or in science, as such in some of basic science. And the, about the wicked problems that you have certainly heard about, so these are the really ugly problems, can be like uh, currently climate change, pandemics, social inequality, or anything with problems with food, energy, uh, health issues, as uh, indicated in this United Nations uh, sustainable developmental goals. My own big problem is the <clears throat> is the relationship between human brain and human mind. Function. Also a problem that can't be attacked with the tools and um, <clears throat> uh, insights of one single discipline. And this all these grand challenges of today. Uh, what is typical for these big problems is there's no formalization of the problem. You can't clearly formulate the problem. And the solutions are not really true or false, but they are better or worse. And after the solution has been obtained, the work will still continue. And some people currently speak also about super weak problems that, for example, seem to be very <clears throat> relevant to climate change like time is running out and those seeking to solve the problems are also those who are causing them. So how could we then cross over the gaps between disciplines? So there certainly are gaps because each discipline has developed a little bit, tried to have its own identity. Two possibilities uh, or no, not two possibilities, but two, two typical uh, scientist types. Uh, they are generalists and they are specialists. And this green one here on the left is uh, like a Leonardo type Renaissance scientist, competent in all fields. And some people may think that, okay, we should try to educate that kind of people. But they easily suffer from shallowness, although they are somehow covering different disciplines, but they are surfing on the surface and not really, they are speaking nicely, but maybe they are not able to go to, to any, any of the depth. And then on the other hand, we have these specialists who can be very narrow, they go very deep in the field, but the danger is that they can stay quite isolated so that even though they have important, uh, important results for the other disciplines, they can't communicate or the other fields can't 
talk to them. So the, uh, the solution to this would be, of course, that let's be carrots. So let's be like the carrots so that we have a very, uh, we have lots of de depth, but we can also have some spread. So um, we can be either, as, as many people speak about this kind of personalities, T-shaped or comp-shaped personalities. T-shaped person has a clear depth in the knowledge, but then also breadth, breadth so that the, that the person can talk to others and understand a little bit other uh, size. And then there are maybe less that kind of people who are these comp-shaped people who have several deep roots and they, of course, can be of different depths. And then they, the breadth comes because they know already several fields. And important to note that only if people have very strong foundation and then also this knowledge of the outside, outside world, only that kind of people can then change the direction of the, the research, for example, like during this kind of pandemic, when they had to leave their own uh, research topic for a while and then focus on, on something else. The better foundation there is and the more there's a spread somehow combined, so better are these people to change the um, direction. So <clears throat> I'm conv convinced that I hope that you would be also <laughs> convinced that we need a somehow new type of scientists. And this, these are these convergent scientists who really focus on important problems. And then how, how people can get or become that kind of scientist. So starting from the left, from these people who play just with their own ideas to those who can also uh, focus together with their colleagues to some uh, common ideas. First is this, grow these deep roots, be a carrot. And for example, the very strong foundation in maths and physics is necessary for uh, uh, quantitative sciences, including neuroscience. I see, I've seen that very strongly, how important it is that people have that kind of <coughs> good ba basic knowledge. And then one has to learn to work in a team, not only in the group that has been formed for, for example, for certain research application or, or something, but it's a team that has a real continuation. Then uh, how to have to learn to communicate uh, with other disciplines. This is something that I now emphasize already several times. Has to have to respect others, keep open mind, and of course, then be aware of in-group versus out-group biases, because these are pretty common. So we see the virtues of our own discipline, and then we see how, uh, how many fault, faulty things the others are doing all the time. Uh, just think about your coffee coffee break discussions sometimes. And then a good advice, what I like to add to any, any research is that one should need to cultivate smart friends and something that I did not uh, dare to put to the slide is just uh, don't work with assholes, just to work with that kind of people you enjoy working. So then it works very well. So and this uh, diversity of perspectives, that's the strength, the force of this kind of approach. So how could then organizations foster convergence? Of course, um, organizations like universities, academies, industry, uh, research team, funding agencies, they all form the ecosystem for scientists. And of course, they provide premises, steady funding for infrastructures, also possibilities for chatting over coffee. There's uh, this 10 meters rule, which is that tells that uh, people should be collaborating, people should be at shouting distance, or that 
that the decay distance of information is about 10 meters. But uh, of course, now during this last year, all this, <coughs> this rule has been violated very strongly. So we have to, but we have to keep it in mind. Uh, so we have to be able to speak to others very much in order to, <coughs> to develop this research. Then uh, these um, organizations, of course, should support sharing knowledge, data, tools, support the bottom-up formation of research teams that then open new avenues, uh, reward people, devoted scientists and leaders who have a vision and not plans, not the most beautifully written plan plans, accept risks and failures and then if needed to redirect or allow these research teams who have had these risks and failures so that they can redirect their research. Also would be nice to that if they could provide civilization courses and with this I'm thinking about some kind of entree courses for new students entering universities so um, would be great if during the first two weeks of the of the <clears throat> studies they could attend um, some kind of teaching that would tell about the most important problems and uh, somehow research that is done in their university so then before going very deep in their own fields they would have some idea about the world around them and of course important to remember is that there's no such a one size fits all solution. It's not, not a reasonable that one would force or just reward in all, all cases people working together with other disciplines. Sometimes it's not the not, not best thing. So this, by the way, this, con, this civilization courses, they would also help the people to come become conversant across disciplines so that they could probably talk already from the young age on also with people from other disciplines. It really is a problem in understanding others deeply. And then this with this uh, here seems like uh, easy to say, like uh, organization departments, they have to think about renewing hiring, tenuring promotion policies so that there would be fair evaluation of young and young and older, whatever, conversion scientists. For example, how the credit is assigned in teams, if there have been lots, of, lots, lots and lots of people, and to which extent is, um, is um, for example, the depth in one discipline weighted against something like a cross-disciplinary work or convergence research and this should be openly stated and we have to acknowledge that most uh, organizations universities don't even have language for all this this type of convergence research and then um, i also wrote here that help in uh, help to identify key problems I would probably be the last one to claim that scientists can't find their problems themselves, but and I'm not uh, meaning here that organizations should say what to study, but they could help. Because, for example, <clears throat> help by giving feedback. For, for example, proposals. Uh, when, when people are submitting proposals, then they get feedback often from very, very qualified people. And then I think they should have then the possibility to improve the application, the same application and making some extra pilot experiments and then develop their problems further and then resubmit as happens in some countries, but not in uh, all countries, not in our country as far as I know if has, hasn't changed just recently. But most important are the problems. So, uh, very much. At, so, as we know, the world is full of problems that have been not solved, but they are not <clears throat> all such urgent problems. We really should sharpen, <laughs> sharpen the uh, this uh, identification of these problems. So, um, 
so I hope that I have provoked you to think about the possibility that we should go towards uh, convergent, uh, convergence research, but uh, just to say that implementation of convergence research is as such a weak problem. And now we know what the weak problem is. It's something very complex. It's difficult to define. It certainly cannot be solved with a single, <coughs> single organizations or disciplines views. It needs uh, a really joint effort. And this will not happen without major changes <coughs> in thinking uh, at several levels. Starting from scientists, then going to the, to the level of organizations, and then trying to also develop common language. So I just would uh, end with this slide from my own interdisciplinary research and all the thanking all the funding that has uh, supported our research over the years. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much, Rita, for that very insightful presentation and a very clear typology that you presented. Uh, we have an on-site question here. Um, Professor Anna Mauranen is here. Uh, please, Anna. Thank you, Rita. This was absolutely wonderful. And uh, I'm very, uh, very attracted to this, uh, uh, this tea, these convergence ideas and the T-shaped carrot persons. However, I have this question of how you cultivate carrots? I mean, what's the best way of doing that? And not only perhaps in your undergraduate years, because uh, very often it happens that it is slightly later in your academic career that you actually notice that you might be in need of other depths. So how to go about it? Have you got any good advice for that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This is a really sort of central question, and uh, uh, I think uh, our experience is that it has happened like that. That we we have had this continuous education in the research teams, weekly seminars, and then that that's been <clears throat> for the research team. And it it typically uh, so I have also quite much experience of that kind of collaboration that people have uh, approached me and our team because we have been doing brain imaging and they come from different fields and then they would just they uh, they have their own questions and they would like us, us to somehow confirm or somehow support they they research typically it does not work if we don't interact quite long time and uh, such uh, regularly so um my advice was this one that what i, I was saying that just for the first uh, undergraduates, so those people who are coming to the university, we would provide some kind of this civilization courses so that they know that there's something outside their own field. But then in research teams, we really have to develop research teams. And this is, uh, of course, in, in uh, sciences, uh, <clears throat> this is the common way of uh, uh, working. But uh, for example, uh, quite um, during the last years, I've been in uh, my office has been at the Department of Art and there's a, there are lots of people who are in artistic research and they work still in like a single persons. They very rarely have any collaborators. So this is the one thing that we have to make really these teams and then educate each other within the teams. That's my uh, suggestion. Thank you, Rita. Um, I have a very short question for you. Um, historian Isaiah Berlin uh, made a distinction based on an ancient uh, Greek poem uh, uh, suggesting that the typology, that there's two types of people, um, foxes who know many small things and hedgehogs who know one big thing, um, to, to paraphrase. Um, so what you're suggesting is that with, it, with convergence, I think we need a new type of an animal to describe what the uh, people who are doing convergence are like. Do you have an idea of what that animal could be? An owl or? Oh, it's a, vegeta it's a vegetable, don't you? I, it is a carrot. 
it's a no, not an animal. Uh, thank you very much for, for the wonderful presentation and, and uh, uh, best to you.